Jeff Thorpe, uh, it's a pleasure to run through your back catalogue and uh, the story of Vicious Rumors, the, the past and the present. Uh, you're the, uh, of course, the founder, uh, the main songwriter, the lead guitar player, and the everything when it comes to, to Vicious Rumors. Uh, so, um, tell us how it all started. I mean, you released your first uh, album in 85. Uh, as far as I understand, you moved from Hawaii and uh, you got signed to, to Shrapnel Records. That's true. Uh, you know, the, the story of Vicious Rumors is a long, winding road that is, uh, that is still going strong today, so uh, uh, there's no end in sight, but uh, we, we have a rich history, man. And uh, yeah, well, I was um, very young uh, in Hawaii, uh, about 15 years old. I really uh, got enthralled with music and just obsessed with, you know, making that my living and wanting to just really jump into it with everything I got. And uh, by the time I was 17, I uh, was able to move to California and start Vicious Rumors in 1979. And then we hooked up with, uh, uh, we started doing gigs at the Old Waldorf in San Francisco. And that was like, you know, like at the time, like the best place the bands could play. A Bill, It was Bill Graham's nightclub. And so, like, you know, you got fed and everybody got a dressing room and it was like a real professional situation. So, and it was uh, the start of something called Metal Mondays. And that's where, like, Laws Rocket and Motley Crue and uh, Metallica and all these bands, like, you know, started off playing down there with Vicious Rumors, you know, and all that time. Back then, Testament was called Legacy. Um, you know, so it was just a long time ago. But uh, through that scene, um, we went on to sign a two-album deal with Shrapnel Records. Uh, it was Shrapnel in the U.S. and Roadrunner um, in, for Europe. Mm. And so, yeah, 1980, uh, I think it was uh, 1985, we, we did the deal, and the album came out in 1986. It was Soldiers of the Night, our first full-length LP. And um, it was a really exciting time, definitely. You know, like, uh, heavy metal was blowing up so big in the mid-'80s. And... Um, so it was just, uh, that album really set the pace for everything we've done today. Um, the critics and the fans really loved it, and it just started a snowball effect that I'm still building hmm. as we speak. So, uh, yeah, the Soldiers of the Night album was um, the beginning for us. Vinnie Moore, of course, now the guitarist for UFO, was uh, that was also his first record. Hmm. And... Um, he so, actually left before you released the album, right? Yes, yeah. He just recorded the album, and, and actually we never really toured or anything like that.
did, <laughs> did you get to tour any uh, after the album? I mean, uh, your vocalist quit and Vinny quit, uh, mm. and of course you, you gathered the the most classic lineup after that. But did you uh, tour anything after the debut? Yeah, actually, um, well, Vinny did. Vinny left the band, and then Gary St. Pierre just got, sort of got sidetracked and was like busy with some other stuff and we found Carl Albert mm -hmm. and so we actually made that change because Carl was just so amazing uh, and we just felt a chemistry with him that you know was undeniable which brought us to our second album Digital Dictator um, Gary St. Pierre left Carl Albert came in Uh, Vinny Moore left, Mark McGee came in. Mm. And then Mark and I went on to establish this really signature guitar sound of Vicious Rumors for the next, you know, seven or eight years. Mm. And then, um, but Digital Dictator uh, was really the beginning of Vicious Rumors touring cycle. Um, that's when we started coming to Europe and then touring in the U.S. and really, really starting to get out. Um, unfortunately, the the... Um, the first album that wasn't really uh, it was more it ended up being more of a recording project uh, for the first album but on Digital Dictator we really established I think the sound of Vicious Rumors with the songwriting and uh, and really sort of kind of came you know built what Vicious Rumors was made out of out of that record and I remember some of the highlights were playing the Ardshock Festival in Zwula in the Netherlands um, with um Megadeth and Testament and Nuclear Assault Sanctuary and Vicious Rumors yeah. I think I think that's was it if I remember correctly um, but yeah Digital Dictator uh, was a real classic album it's it's still considered um, you know in the press to be a uh, one of the all time classic heavy metal albums from the 80s so I'm really proud of that you know um, and um It really set the pace for uh, for us to continue. Hmm. There is a backward message in the end of the album. Yeah. Who came up with it, that idea? Oh God! It's hard, it's hard to play that now. You don't have vinyl anymore. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, you know, uh, Shrapnel re-released Digital Dictator. I, actually, we have them here uh, at the show. Huh? And on at the end of the CD, you hear it backwards, and then they played it forward, so you can actually hear oh, what they what they're saying <laughs> afterwards. And it was it was one of my ideas that um, I just at the time a lot of bands were getting a lot of flack for putting these uh, evil messages and uh, and doing all this stuff. So we thought it would be funny to put kind of a really evil sounding message that was a uh, you know not only was it uh, you know really wicked sounding, but it was something that um, you know. But when you hear it back, it was like be nice to your mom and dad. Don't abuse drugs, you know that kind of thing. So it was like this really silly message. I actually uh, heard you're, you're you're planning to play the whole album uh, during a gig. Is that true? Yeah, we um, we had planned to do something like that, but actually it didn't it didn't materialize. Mm -hmm. um, mainly because of our new album, the response to our new record was so incredible that um, I'll save that story till we get to the new record. Yeah. But but. We were going to come out and do that, and then the new album just blew up for us. So um, we focused on that. Is that, but it's something that we that we talked about doing at one point, and I could see us doing that, like a special, um, you know, maybe even doing a few shows where we play entire albums or something like that, you yeah. know. So uh, we're always, you know, Vicious Rumors has been around for so long. We have such a big family and a big history that you know. Um, that we can do special events like that you know like we just did a reunion with Mark McGee and Kevin Albert Carl's son yeah, at the Keep It True festival people loved it uh, we had Gary St. Pierre come back to the band and do the Headbangers open air people loved that and uh, you know it, and it felt great to do those reunions and um, celebrate 33 years of heavy metal
and then there is your uh, third album, uh, self-titled. One of my favorites as well. Oh, thank um, you. And, um, are you pleased with what that album did for you? And uh, as a, well, the album after the the masterpiece, uh, Digital Dictator. Well, um, you know, after Digital Dictator, we felt like we, um, as I was saying earlier, like we really established the sound of Vicious Rumors. So uh, it was very exciting for us to uh, get signed to Atlantic Records at that time. It was our first uh, major label experience. And um, the uh, so we decided, like, since like we felt like we were, like, coming out on a new major label and, like, being introduced to a lot of more... Uh, fans and promotion, distribution, and that type of thing. So we did it. We decided to call that album just simply "Vicious Rumors," and um, it was kind of a new beginning for us. But uh, again, I think uh, we really, um, you know, we really just took the sound of the band and and um, just kept evolving. You know, with the chemistry that we had of um, you know Mark McGee, Carl Albert. Dave Starr, myself, and Larry Howe. And um, that combination stayed together uh, for over nine years uh, through those albums. So, you know, you know how hard it is maybe just to keep a relationship together with just a man and a woman. But we actually had the five of us were, you know, slugging it out for a long time. So, but yeah, that was a, a real, that was, that album was the first major touring. That That was when we started, like, leaving our house for, like, three months at a time and doing major U.S. tours and European tours. And um, so it was a a very exciting time. And um, our first time that we made uh, videos for MTV, we made a video for Don't Wait For Me. And, um, you know, that was getting some airplay on the Headbangers Ball. And, you know, it was just a, a, a very exciting time. We did tons of shows and festivals. And I think that, um, you know, by that time, um, you know, Vicious Rumors was really, really going full speed.
Welcome to the Ball, another strong album and um, well, probably your your best selling album ever. Is that right? Well, um, you know that's that's questionable. I think it uh, certainly one of them, mm. certainly one of them, uh, maybe the top one. Uh, you know that was our second major uh, major label album, uh, Welcome to the Ball, our fourth album and second album on Atlantic. This album again, uh, extensive touring. We uh, we actually left our house and were gone for five months straight on that tour, um, which is something that doesn't happen so often nowadays. But um, you know they're usually in little shorter chunks. But that one we did a five month tour. We played all over the world. Um, we went to Japan. Uh, we made a live album, uh, Plug In and Hang On, live in Tokyo. Um, so, ag- again, Mark McGee and I really meshed as guitar players and our s- songwriting abilities together. And, um, you know, along with Carl Albert, uh, who was just, um, he just got better and better on every record and every year. And, you know, Carl was just such a natural. Uh, it was just it was amazing. Like we could, we just threw the, we threw everything in the kitchen sink at him. Uh, you know, twelve shows in a row, night after night. Um, anything we, you know, long drives, whatever we had to do, and it was just easy for him. You know, I mean, it was just he was just one of those guys. He was just so gifted, and uh, it just was never. It was just, it wasn't difficult for him. He, you know, not only did he make it look easy, it just was easy for him. And uh, he's just an incredible ear for melody and pitch, and was just you know, a, you know, such an honor to to play music and have him as my brother, man, in arms. And just you know, he was an amazing man, very funny, um, you know, uh, super talent, but none of the um, none of the asshole lead singer. You know, he was always kind to people and. You know, even when he wasn't sick or in a bad mood, he just, that's just the type of person he was, you know. So, uh, yeah, Welcome to the Ball was really a a great time for Vicious Rumors. That was the first time we went to Japan and uh, did some sold out shows there. And so we were very excited, like things were really rolling and um, a lot of fond memories. Hmm. Uh, What are your your favorite tracks from the album? Hmm. I'd have to say that. I I always thought Six Stepsisters was like one of my creepiest songs, mm-hmm. and uh, um, you know, Abandon was one that I loved a lot. Um, Strange Behavior, um, you know, Only Live Twice, and I thought the ballad on there, When Love Comes Down, was a, a really uh, uh, you know melodic, powerful ballad.
the next album was actually the live album, the yeah. the plug in and hang on. Um, that came after Welcome to the Ball, and that was our third album on Atlantic Records and our last album for Atlantic. Um, uh, it was incredible. We went to Tokyo. We did two sold out shows in Tokyo, and um, they we knew we were going to make a live album, so. Uh, they brought Mark McGee and myself to a recording studio after the concert. So then we were up all night after the show, mix you know in a studio, you know doing the mix and doing a couple yeah. little guitar touch ups and things like that. And it was just Mark and I. And the funny thing was like you know a studio it, when you're in a recording studio, it's very important that you have clear communication with your engineer and producers. Well, these guys in Japan did not speak a word of English. So we were in the studio with an interpreter trying to communicate through a middleman, you know, in a recording studio, which is a, it was a pretty strange situation. But it was very exciting. I mean, it was the first time we were in Japan. We got such an incredible welcome by the Japanese people, as we always have. And, um, we made this this live album in one night. We recorded it that night. Mark and I went to a studio and did the mix with an interpreter. And then we got back to the hotel just in enough time to take a shower, leave, and get the bullet train to Osaka and do a next show in another city. So it was a, a really fascinating experience. Um, I remember the promoter took us out to dinner and for a real traditional Japanese dinner and we kind of made a pact to each other we're like all right whatever they serve us I don't care if it has eyeballs or tentacles or you know we're gonna eat it you know we're gonna try it and then and there, there was some very interesting uh you know authentic uh Japanese uh courses that all came out in several courses man and we but we enjoyed it we had a great time and uh We've always had a soft spot for Japan because it's always been such an incredible experience, similar to what happens for us here in Europe in a different way. But, mm. but um, really thankful to our following and our fans and friends over there. And um, yeah, that 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 should uh, that kind of brings up what happened for Plug In and Hang On.
And then you had uh, the first line of change, the first uh, you know long row. Uh, your bassist left the band, right? That, that's correct. Um, Dave, um, we we started working on songs for the Word of Mouth album, and um, it just we just weren't clicking with Dave. I don't know. It just sort of, I guess the directions just started changing, and so uh, it, uh, Carl Albert suggested his friend Tommy Cisco who was in a band villain with Carl before Vicious Rumors and Tommy a uh, great guy personal guy um, Tommy came in just as we were making the album actually Mark McGee did most of the bass on that record because um, Tommy was very new to the band but Tommy did play on on the word of mouth album and again uh, this was the first time that we came back to Europe more than once in a year. Like we actually came back two or three times. We did some summer festivals with Accept, and then we did a big long tour called the Ultimate Power Force, with um, Metal Church, Vicious Rumors, and it was supposed to be Riot, but they canceled, and so it was us and Zodiac Mind Warp open. But yeah, the and then the word of mouth album was. Um, I think really our most diverse album. Like if you look at, if you listen to our albums, uh, when you get to word of mouth, we really uh, just all the different aspects of everything we'd gone through in our career sort of came to a head, and we were kind of pulled in a lot of different directions. You know, Vicious Rumors has sort of always been in between something that was really heavy and something that was really melodic, which I always loved because I felt that it, you know. In, in the Bay Area, you've got a lot of very successful, long-lasting bands. You've got Death Angel, Vicious Rumors, Testament, Exodus, mm -hmm. you know, all these bands that have stood the test of time. Um, and, and we're really proud of that. Um, but at the same time, there, I think Testament, Death Angel, and Exodus are much more similar than Vicious Rumors. You can't, you don't, you can't really throw Vicious Rumors in with that because we do a lot of... You know, we have a little bit more of a melodic thing. We've kind of had a little different kind of a musical approach where they're, those bands are a little more thrashy and stuff. But at the same time, you know, that kind of set us apart. And uh, and just that's just who we were, you know, and, and who we are. So um, the Word of Mouth album um, uh, is a, probably our most artistic and most versatile album. And I was very proud of it. And... Um, we did, again, lots of touring, and uh, Carl really sang his ass off, and, and unfortunately that was his uh, last studio record.
Well, this is uh, the uh, tribute to Carl Albert album. Uh, he was um, killed in an accident. Yeah. How did you experience that? Oh, man, I got a call from his girlfriend. She was hysterical, and I was sound asleep. And at the at that time, all she knew was that uh, Carl was had been in an accident, and she didn't really know anything. So she was kind of real frantic, and I just... And I and I just kind of calmed her down. And I go, well, look, if it was really serious, we would have heard something, you know. So don't worry about it. You know, let's let's find out what's going on, and then we, you know, we get to the hospital and find out that he's, you know, very seriously injured, never regained consciousness. Uh, he was in life support for uh, about five, six days, and then there was just no no coming back. But uh, very very dark time in my life. Uh, not not only you know, for our career, do we lose, uh, you know, the incredible sound of our band, the vocals, but we also lost our dear, dear friend and brother, you know, so it was just kind of a double, double whammy, your your career and your friend, you know, so it was, it was a very hard time for us, and a lot of, lot of people, uh, you know, supported us for, during that time, and, you know, we got a lot of love from our fans and friends, and, you know, when we were we were sort of confused, weren't sure exactly what we were going to do at that point, and that's what led to the tribute to Carl Albert album. Um, these are live recordings, completely untouched. Everything is 100% live, no overdubs, and that that's basically outtakes from different performances on the Word of Mouth tour. Yeah. And so we just wanted to do something special to, uh, you know, to... to to something that you know just to show people how what an incredible singer he was no overdubs nothing just 100 percent live and um do it in our own way you know they're like our own home recordings like that you know we there are personal recordings we did on the tour you know sort of this album really wasn't involved with any record company it was just something that we did hmm. uh you said you were uh, playing a gig where his uh, son came on stage does it sound at all like his father or is it it would give is you he a singer it, well he's not really a singer he's mm -hmm. a guitar player ah. but it would have given you chills really because he's just genetically like his father he looks like him he, <laughs> he, he his sense of humor is like him his voice his speaking voice is like him i mean when we hang out around him he just blows our mind he'll he'll, he'll crack jokes or do something and, and we'll just be like oh my god it's just just like being with carl again and when and he's saying it keep it true he's not he doesn't practice being a singer or anything if he worked on it and practiced he could be as good or maybe better than his dad i mean he's got an incredible talent but you know he doesn't want to do that. He wants to do his music. He wants to be a guitar player, and you know he's got to follow his own destiny. Hmm. But um, he did an incredible job, and people were blown away at "Keep It True." How much he sounded like Carl. Just the tone of his voice sounds like Carl Albert. So yeah, it was incredible. And to do the show with Mark and Tommy and Kevin and Larry and I, we were just looking around. It was like going back in time, man. Yeah, sure. It was it was a fantastic experience.
Uh, and then Mark actually left the band. Was that after Carl's death? Yeah. Oh, and it was actually before. before. Mm-hmm. It was before, yeah. After, see, word of mouth, as I was saying, how is like our most melodic album. Mark always leaned towards the more melodic side. He really, he really loved female vocals, and you know, he he was always loved metal, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't his main thing. You know what I mean? He liked more like pop music and female artists. You know, and he's kind of more of a sensitive guy. You know, there's a brilliant guitar player, monster one of the best ever in my opinion um but you know uh after word of mouth you know we wanted to go we we were kind of like you know it was fun to do an artistic record like that but we want to fucking come back with balls you know what i mean we wanted it to be heavy mm. and that's where mark was like well you know i kind of want it to be more melodic you know what i mean so unfortunately um that's where mark decided to leave the band and then carl and i started working on the songs for something burning Mm-hmm. And then, unfortunately, we all know what happened. Yeah. So on, on the uh, Something Burning album, you actually did the vocals yourself? Well, I did because we were so, you know, we tried out singers and we actually found some really good singers, man. But we were so screwed up in our own minds, man. It was just like, it just didn't, we just didn't feel it. You know, mm-hmm. we we couldn't, we couldn't make that connection with anybody. We actually found Brian O'Connor at that time and just... It just wasn't right, you know. So we've said hell with it, man. We're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna start off again, and we're gonna do the first Vicious Rumors album four piece that yeah. we've always been a five piece band, and we did it four piece with me, Larry, and myself doing the vocals, and it was a real, um, you know, gutsy, slim down version, more like straight ahead meat and potatoes, and you know, some people loved it and some people didn't. And uh, you know, how do you look up on the album? Um, you know, no. I I just look at it now as something that we, you know, in hindsight, I think it probably would have been better to get a singer and just continue on the path like we're on now. Mm-hmm. But it was just something we had to do for ourselves, man. We were screwed up, and uh, you know, music is all about emotion, and you know, we it's just very intertwined with our feelings and stuff. So. I was, you know, I'm proud of all of my records. You know, I mean, I think that there's some really good songs in Something Burning. You know, my voice is totally different from what Carl was, so it was a big departure. It was a, it was a risky move, and, um, you know, to I wanted after doing that, and we went on tour. We did a big tour with Accept, and I was, you know, with Udo, and I was singing and opening up for Udo, and it was, it was a great tour, and we got a great response live.
I wanted to be able to recreate some of the back catalog and I wanted to move ahead with my original plans. Yeah. And so that's why after we kind of got that out of our system and we kind of accepted the change, we decided, okay, we're going to bring back a singer. And that's when we went back and, and looked at Brian O'Connor again mm -hmm. and brought him in for the next album, Cyber Christ. Yeah. And Bill is a, a brilliant vocalist. Thank you. Yeah, I thought so too. You lost Mark as your writing partner here, I guess. Uh, of course, on the, the previous album as well. But uh, was it very different to, to start writing stuff alone, or wasn't that a problem? Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, I've always sort of been, I've always sort of written a lot on my own anyway, and then got together with the guys with ideas and bounced back and forth. And so um, that didn't really change. I just did it with Larry and you know mm. Carl and the other guys instead of Mark. Um, I did not want Mark to go, and I've always sort of wanted him to come back because him and I have a chemistry that I think that's just sort of undeniable. But it wasn't it wasn't going to stop me from continuing on my journey, and um, so you know. Um, It was just a new day, man. I just look at it like all these albums are like a, a snapshot in time in my life. And um, that's where I was at that time. And, um, you know, like I said, man, I'm proud of all these records. Cyber Christ is kind of a real strange, kind of a dark album. Like, but slight, you know, with elements of classic Vicious Rumors, but also kind of a, you know, a turmoil of a new band, mm. you know, discovering itself. Um, There are some some great tracks here. I mean, the title you. track is is fantastic. One of my favorites is uh, actually the last one, Faith. Oh, it's yeah, it's a great track. Thank you. We actually uh, played that live on the Blind Guardian tour. We uh, we did a big tour with Blind Guardian on that album, and um, we played Cyber Christ and Kill the Day and um, Downpour and Faith. So we, we did a bunch of songs from that record and got a great response from it. I think Faith is probably the most classic Vicious Rumors song on that album. Probably why I like it oh, <laughs> that much. <laughs> th thank you.
Uh, and then uh, for the next one, you had uh, a few lineup changes uh, again. That was Sadistic Symphony in 2001. Yes, yeah, you know, coming out of the end of the 90s, uh, the whole changing of the guard for heavy metal, um, the Seattle sound with Nirvana and Alice in Chains sort of kind of changing everything. Yeah. It's kind of a real, you know, it was a difficult time for bands like us, uh, but, you know, we kept the heavy metal flag held high as we have throughout our whole career. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, these are the something burning cyber Christ sadistic symphony years were just really, um, you know, I did not want to stop even though maybe I wasn't, didn't have everything in place, but I just, I felt the need to keep going and to keep making records. I knew that I would land on my feet eventually. And, um, you know, again, like there's some some pretty powerful songs. Unfortunately, for this record, Sadistic Symphony, um, we had a lot of problems with the mix. Um, the track, the the album did not come out the way that I envisioned it, and um, it's sort of my one black mark on all my records because what happened was we, we recorded it with one person and we were not happy with the way they mixed it the record company the record company offered to have a european guy uh, remix it and we took him up on that offer but the first engineer was so insulted that instead of sending the european guy all our final tracks he sent him everything even the stuff we threw away oh. Instead of just oh, right. instead of just sending <laughs> yeah. him the final stuff to mix everything that we picked out, he just <laughs> sent him. He was so butt hurt that we had somebody else mix it. He sent him everything, and who who is the? I can't even remember the asshole's name, uh, and I'm just gonna find his name because any band should avoid working with this guy, Phil Bright. Don't ever yeah. hire this guy to work for your band because <laughs> it was an awful experience. But um, that album, if, if you listen to the Japanese version of the Sadistic Symphony, they got, they kept the original. Oh, really? Yeah, they kept wow. the original, even though the, it, we had problems in the studio, and we, what, we weren't happy with the way it sounded, but at least the Japanese one has the right tracks. So the European one has a little better sound quality, mm. but it's got all these wrong parts all over the place. Which so if you if you ever liked that record, mm -hmm. try to find the Japanese one because they at least have the right parts. But after after that experience, that's when I like never turn. I now now I'm involved in every aspect of the recording producing of these records. I will never let that happen again. Oh, this 
But it took a five more years, and then you came back with Warble. Yes, that was uh, another hard-hitting album. Definitely, um, you know, I had broken my back in um, 2002 after this record and so I was completely I, I thought maybe it could have been a career ending injury as so I cracked my spine oh. in two places I had to have a, a spine fusion I've got like six big pins in my back right now really? just fused together in my spine and so that took me out completely out of the loop for like three years and then I slowly built my way back and then re, you know by just sheer will and determination and some good luck was able to resume um it's something i have to deal with every day i still i mean touring and doing all this stuff is very difficult for me physically but i you know i'm i just i love it it's in my blood and so you know i'm i'm very thankful that i'm still able to do it sure. but, but th that's why we had a five-year gap um until the warball album came out where um I partnered up with James Rivera from Hellstar on the vocals for that one. And, you know, Warball was a real big comeback album for us. Um, also enlisted the friend, help of my friend Brad Gillis on guitar from Ozzy and Night Ranger. Right. And also Larry and Dave came back to the band. Yes, Larry and Dave with the original rhythm section mm -hmm. coming back. So that, with my guitar and Larry and Dave, that was really like the heart of the Vicious Rumors sound, you know, so... We, did you call Mark? <laughs> yes. Yeah. We of course I did. I tried to get Mark to come back, man. <laughs> um, but you know, Mark is in a band now called Love Planet with his wife, and he's he's always loved female vocals, mm. and he finally found his female lead singer that he fell in love with, and their music is not metal at all. It's kind of psychedelic pop, kind of poppy with a little bit of psychedelic stuff and then real good harmonies. They're very good, high quality musicianship and, you know, incredible guitar playing. But, you know, he's he's just kinda gone a completely different direction, you know. And that and that's all good. He's still part of the family. He can makes appearances on my records. We do special shows together. And we're and we're totally, you know, we're very close. Mm. And I support him, I know, even though I want him in Vicious Rumors, but I still support him and wish him, you know, all the best. He's my brother. Mm. Uh, the lineup on this album, uh, was that supposed to be stable or were there session members? I mean, Brad Gillis was probably just yeah. a guest. We knew Brad was, you know, was just make, helping us out and being a guest. Uh, and, then, and then we actually got Thane Rasmussen to be in the band, who was also on the record. And he's our guitar player tonight also. So, right. so he's back in a, in vicious rumors. As I said earlier, you know, we've been around a long time. We got a big family, so we got, we got a lot of guys to go back to. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, at the Alcatraz Festival uh, in Belgium this year, vicious rumors headlined the second stage, and I had a big surprise for everybody because Death Angel, Forbidden, Hell Star, and Where Angels Suffer, uh, all were at the show and the same festival and they all had former members of Vicious Rumors really? and I realized it when I was in the catering room I started looking around I'm like wow there's well Steve Smythe uh, Ira Black I'm like holy god it just and it just hit me so I went around to all of them and said hey guys I want to blow the crowd away tonight and do don't wait for me at the end of our set with every member of Vicious Rumors that's here tonight <laughs> and so we surprised the audience man we Steve Smythe, Ira Black, Kiyoshi Morgan, myself on guitar, four guitars, Stephen Goodwin on bass, James Rivera, Brian Allen on vocals, and uh, Larry Howe and Will Carroll on drums from Death Angel. And so we, we, we performed with nine members of Vicious Rumors, all formally formal band members, and it was incredible, man. Sure. And, and that was just another kind of a historic thing thing that we were able to do with all these different guys mm -hmm. but yeah so the Warball album uh, again a very important album for us a big comeback <laughs>
my latest album, yeah. Razorback Killers. That is uh, just pure dynamite. I mean, uh, it totally blew me away. It will be on my top 10 list for, for 2011. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it must be a fantastic feeling to, to release such an album now. It was incredible. I mean, the response that we got on that record, we haven't got a response like that since Digital Dictator. And, and a lot of people were comparing that. We were actually, um, Soldiers of the Night and Digital Dictator were reached number one in Rock Hard Magazine mm. uh, in those years. And Razorback Killer was also number one in Rock Hard. And so to do that in, 2000, in 1988 and then again in 2011 was incredibly rewarding. <laughs> and, we've, and which led to this incredible year we've had. We have already played 62 shows in Europe this year, and I've got 30 more booked on this tour with Hammerfall. So, I mean, we're going to do 92 shows on the Razorback Killer Tour in Europe, more than double of anything we've ever done before. We played so many great festivals. The band got higher up on the bill. Um, we're just having the best year of our career in 2011. After this incredible journey of Vicious Rumors, the Razorback Killer album, just everybody loved it, man. And uh, I'm, we're so proud of it. We're, we're having the time of our lives. Larry and I, you know, has been my partner in crime this whole time. Um, you know, except for the one black mark. But um, it's just been amazing, man. Um, we did three festivals with Hammerfall, and on the third one at Summer Breeze, they invited us to do this tour. And it's just such an incredible way to end the year, as we have just had the year that every band dreams about this year. I'm super thankful, and uh, I just, the fans... Uh, make it so worthwhile for us you know we have so many great fans and and the following that we have has been so incredible getting new fans all the time and um you know we love the action you know my band i've always had a group of guys that was like very personable and like you know we're not a type of band that just hangs out backstage we're always out talking to people meeting people and um you know life is short man and we just you know, I just want to live it to the fullest, man, every day. And so I'm already working on a new album. I've gone through my whole history of my band with you here today and tried to think of all the highlights. And I'm, I'm sure I left a lot. Of course, I left a lot of things out. But, you know, um, we've got a great new record coming up. And we're going and, and to go back in and... Um, we're gonna, it's not going to be another five years till you get a new VR record. It's going to be like about a year, maybe. Okay. Maybe, maybe less. But we're going back in the studio. We're going we're gonna to bust out another killer, kick-ass album for you. And uh, it's just an honor and a privilege for me to be here today talking to you. Thank you very much. Yeah.